Okay, so today we are going to talk about a very important topic that is inflammatory bowel disease which you study extensively in your surgery. So everybody knows how many types of inflammatory bowel diseases are there? Two types, isn't it? Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So you have to be very clear about both of them. So now you must have studied them in your surgery but let's understand what all we have to know in pathology in this. So first what you know, we'll discuss what you know and then we will discuss why this happens, what is the cause, okay, pathology behind it. So first let's see what you know, okay. So when we talk about Crohn's disease, always remember that the first lesion that starts here, okay, is an aphethous ulcer like the one which happens in your mouth that's called aphethous ulcers so these are very small ulcers which occur in the mouth after uh, uh, which are similar to that occur in the mouth so this starting lesion is a aphethous ulcer then this ulcer will start growing in its long axis and this is called serpentine ulcers please remember these are very uh, deep ulcers. Why? Because Crohn's is a transneural disease. So it involves through and through the muscle. Therefore, uh, this causes, when it occurs through and through, it causes fistulas and fissures. Obviously, what will happen? Your body will not sit quietly, okay, let fistula happen. No, it will respond, isn't it? So how does it respond? So the fat from the, uh, uh, from the mesentery will start coming and wrapping around it. What is that called? creeping fat. What is that called? Creeping fat. So creeping fat will come and wrap around it. Not only that, there will be submucosal fibrosis which will occur. The muscularis will start showing you a little bit of uh, you know response, hypertrophy. So because of that, the wall thickness will be increased and the patient will start getting strictures. So patient will st start getting strictures. Now point is, where is all this happening? Which part of the intestine? See it can involve any part of the intestine but most commonly it involves small intestine okay especially the ileum ileocecal region they are very commonly involved ileum small intestine is involved in 40 percent of the cases okay so that is small intestine is usually more commonly involved but remember it can involve any part of the intestine okay now also remember that these ulcers when they occur so there is a serpentine ulcer this lesion occurs but it occurs in a skip manner. So there are ulcers, normal, ulcers, normal, ulcers, normal. So there's a very characteristic change that happens. You can see the normal uh, mucosa and then there will be an ulcer. Then there will be normal mucosa, then there will be an ulcer. Normal mucosa and ulcer. So this gives a very classical appearance. What is this appearance called as? This is called as cobblestone appearance. Have you seen cobblestones? How are they? So look at these. These are normal intestines and below them there is a ulcers going on. This is through and through ulcers. So can you see these are all ulcers. Okay. So these are all ulcers which are going up and normal mucosas are there. You understand that? So that appearance is called cobblestone appearance. Okay. Now once we have cleared about it. So I hope you remember now that it is a transmural disease here the intestine wall, wall is thickened because some mucosal fibrosis is there muscularis hypertrophy is there and there is fistula fissures and creeping fat now once we are clear about this we should understand what do you understand by an active Crohn's disease or an active IBD so whenever I say active disease active disease always means that neutrophils have started collecting in the crypts now Okay, so if you know the crypts, if you know the crypts, so normally the crypts are like these. They are very well parallel crypts like this. This is a normal crypt. So let's uh, see the uh, real histopathology of a normal crypt. Yes, so this is what is a normal crypt. Very neat, clean, uh, parallel, very nice crypt. So first indicator of active diseases that these crypts become full of neutrophils. These crypts become full of neutrophils and that is called as crypt abscess. What is this called as? Crypt abscess. So crypt abscess just means this is a crypt and it is full of neutrophils. So this just means that this is a active disease. So active disease is indicated first by crypt abscess. Now second thing that happens in uh, any active diseases, see once you get crypt abscess, obviously the crypt is going to get destroyed. So there will be 
repeated cycles of crypt destruction and regeneration. So this is normal parallel crypt. Now what is happening? Look at this. So now these crypts start showing unusual branching and unusual orientations. So they are trying to heal, isn't it? So normal parallel crypts start showing unusual branching and orientation. So they start showing unusual branchings. Not only that, the epithelium here, the epitheliums will start showing metaplasia. I hope you remember metaplasia is adaptation to cellular injury. So injury is occurring, so it will start adapting. So which kind of metaplasias can be seen here? So we can have either pseudopyloric metaplasia or painted cell metaplasia, especially in the left colon. So we can have pseudopyloric metaplasias or painted metaplasias. Please remember here that these findings will persist. So once the crypt has become unusual, branched, it persists even if inflammation subsides. Okay, so that means most important indicator of active inflammation is crypt abscess. But once after the abscess, after the destruction, the healing has occurred, unusual branching occurs, it will try to, uh, it will be healed, okay, and it will persist even after the active inflammation is not there. You understand that? So remember these points, okay. Are we clear with this? So unusual branching, metaplasias are indicative of an active disease which has occurred and then it has caused change even after the active disease finishes it persists okay now once we are clear with this now let's come to the uh, next disease okay one more point here uh, which you should remember we will go to the pathogenesis later but one more point that you should always remember here is that in uh, Crohn's disease, Th1 cells are activated. So Th1 cells will go and activate interferon gamma, which will change the macrophages into epithelioid cells. So therefore, in cases of Crohn's disease, what will you see? You will see non-caseating epithelioid cell granuloma. So can you see? This is a giant cell. Can you see? These are all elongated cells here like this. So what are all these elongated cells? Epithelioid cells. So you can see epithelioid cells, you can see Langhan, uh, uh, you can see giant cells here, isn't it? So here we have a Langhan type of giant cell which is occurring, okay? So we can have giant cells, we have epithelioid cells, but there is no caseous necrosis. So this is a non-caseating epithelioid cell granuloma, which is a hallmark of Crohn's disease, a morphological hallmark. So once you see, it, so it is not always seen, okay? Uh, once you see uh, non-caseating granuloma, you can be pretty sure, you can be pretty sure that yes, this is Crohn's disease. So remember this point. So if somebody asks you how many percent of Crohn's disease will show you granuloma, 35% of the Crohn's disease shows you granuloma. Once it is seen, you can make sure that this is a Crohn's disease. But every Crohn's disease does not show you a granuloma. Okay. So remember which T cells are activated in Crohn's disease? Th1 cells are predominantly activated in Crohn's disease. Okay. Now let's come to ulcerative colitis. So what happens in ulcerative colitis? So remember name itself is saying ulcer colitis, ulcer occurring in a colitis. So first point you should remember is that ulcerative colitis usually occurs in rectum, usually occurs in large intestine, especially rectum. So rectum is always involved, but it can involve any part of the large intestine. In fact, it can even involve ileum. So once it ileum is involved, what is this called as? Backwash ileitis. What is this called? Backwash ileitis. But one part which is always involved in uh, ulcerative colitis is rectum. Okay, so how does it start? So Crohn starts as small aphethous ulcer, but ulcerative colitis doesn't start like that. Okay, so ulcerative colitis, what happens is, to start with, initially you get a red granular mucosa. So first thing that you get is the mucosa starts becoming red and granular. After that, broad based ulcer is formed. What type of ulcer was seen in Crohn's? It was, it was, it was an aphethous ulcer. Here, which type of ulcer do you see? You see a broad based ulcer. So here you are going to see a broad based ulcer. Okay. Once you see a broad based ulcer, okay, now what will happen? This ulcer will try to heal. This ulcer will try to heal. So the surrounding normal mucosa will start regenerating, okay. So this will start regenerating. And when the mucosa starts regenerating, it forms 
polyp. But they are not true polyp. This is just regenerating mucosa. Therefore, this is called as pseudo polyps. What are they called as? Pseudo polyps. Okay. So, these are called as pseudo polyps. Also, you should remember that once the pseudo polyps are formed, there are lots of pseudo polyps which are formed, which are close together. So, tips of these polyps usually fuse together, usually bridge together, and this is what is called as mucosal bridges. What are these called as? Mucosal bridges. So, when there is a lot of pseudo polyps which are formed, the tips of these polyps bridge together, and what is this called? Mucosal bridges. Now, where is this occurring? The same question which we asked in Crohn, same question I am going to ask you here also. Where is this occurring? So, we have already seen it is usually occurring in the large intestine and the second, it is very superficial disease. So, it just involves mucosa and submucosa. Now, because it is not through and through disease, there will be no fistula, there will be no fissures, there will be no response of the intestine to this. So, no uh, strictures, no fibrosis, nothing ok so it is a very superficial disease involving only mucosa and submucosa but sometimes ok when it is involved mucosa and submucosa see muscularis propria has ganglion cells so sometimes these ganglion cells are damaged when these ganglion cells are damaged it changes it forms toxic megacolon what does it forms toxic megacolon so remember always Toxic megacolon is seen in ulcerative colitis. Toxic megacolon is seen in ulcerative colitis. Again, the same question uh, which I asked you in uh, Crohn's. What do you understand by active ulcerative colitis? First, everybody knows now. One, that the crypts will be full with neutrophil. And what is this called? Cryptapsis. And here also, obviously, once the cryptapsis is formed, crypts are damaged, so it will also lead to healing, branching of the crypt, and there will be pseudopyloric metaplasia here also. You understand that? So, is everybody clear with this? So, this is active disease. So, can I say cryptapsis can occur in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease? Yes. It just means it is active. Can I say branching of the crypt can occur in both? Yes. It can occur in both. Okay, but mucosal bridges, if somebody asks, only in ulcerative colitis. If transmural disease, strictures, creeping fat, Crohn's disease. So, in contrast to the Crohn's disease where Th1 cells were activated, in ulcerative colitis, Th2 cells are activated. So, in ulcerative colitis, which cells are activated? Th2 cells are activated. Everybody should be clear about this. Okay. So, once everybody is clear about it, okay, everybody knows about it, now we should now uh, try to understand uh, that what is the uh, pathogenesis of these inflammatory bowel disease. But before going to the pathogenesis, let us see some images here of ulcerative colitis. Okay, so first, can you see this? Now, in contrast to cobblestone, what are you seeing here? full of polyps there are small 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 polyps which are coming up so what is this called as pseudo polyps okay also you all know that the tips of the polyps will start showing branching so can you see these polyps have started abnormal branching so what is this branching one more point here you know sometimes they ask you that uh, the uh, distinction between the uh, involved area and the uninvolved area is very distinct in uh, ulcerative colitis true or not Yes, true. So, part which is involved, it, it is very red, granular, it shows pseudo polyps, bridgings, okay, whereas which is not involved is normal. But it is only one lesion, it is not a skip lesion. In uh, what happens in Crohn's? Ulcer normal, ulcer normal. So, that gives cobblestoning, okay. But here, only one part is involved, and the involved part will be red, granular, broad ulcers, regenerating mucosa, bridging. But this part is separate and this part is separate. You understand that? So, remember always, skip lesions means normal ulcer, normal ulcer, normal ulcer, okay? Whereas, uh, uh, ulcerative colitis is normal and different. You understand that? Is everybody clear with this? So, that point has to be very clear to you, okay? Now, Obviously, both can turn into malignancy, both can show you dysplasia, obviously you are having metaplasia, abnormal branching of the crypts, so it can later on lead to dysplasia and carcinoma. 
So if somebody asks you which is more prone to develop carcinoma, so who is getting mucosal bridges and abnormality more? So this is ulcerative colitis. So ulcerative colitis and there is lot of regeneration occurring. So when there is so much hyperplasia occurring, obviously there is more chances of developing cancer. So more chances of developing cancer is in ulcerative colitis. But yes, Crohn's can also develop cancer. Okay. So this is IBD associated neoplasias. Okay. Apart from that, now let's now uh, let's uh, go to the pathogenesis which we had to study. So everybody should be clear with the difference between cobblestoning and between the pseudopolyps. Okay. Now let's just come to the pathogenesis. Okay. To understand the pathogenesis, it's a very simple pathogenesis. If you remember that any IBD is a triad. Any IBD is a triad. So what is a triad? What are the three things, three major components of inflammatory bowel disease. First, number one, that the patient has altered microbiome. What do you understand by altered microbiome? What is microbiome? See, all our body is full of microbes. All our body is full of microbes. And the, these microbes are diverse. More the diversity, better the nutritional status of an individual. So we have lot of microbe, we have our own microbiome, okay, which defines us, okay. So now what happens, microbiome, if it gets altered, this is a very important culprit for IBDs. This is a very important culprit for inflammatory bowel disease. So everybody should remember here one more point. What should you remember here? Remember that... Uh, uh, you know, uh, there is there are lots of diseases. So whenever the microbiomes are fully altered, this is called dysbiosis. So one example of dysbiosis is pseudomembranous colitis. Okay. So remember, there is a hypothesis which is pro proposed. Okay, with the development of you know diseases because of altered microbiome. This is called hygiene hypothesis. You know what is that? This is whenever we start maintaining lot of hygiene. Okay, then what happens? Uh, suppose we start eating canned foods so we remove all the all the microbes from our diet see normal our immune cells are very happy fighting with the local um, flora of the uh, intestine okay so it's very happy it requires some microbes to come inside when lots of microbes comes it's very happy fighting okay with them and it is busy all the time so nobody should be free ever you remember that so uh, so when we do lot of hygiene what will happen so because of lot of hygiene, now the immune cells don't get anything to do. So they have no function. They think, oh, some, some bacteria should come. I should fight. What to do? What to do? What to do? So it's not finding anybody to fight. So what happens? These become aberrant. They become aberrant. So immune cells become aberrant. And they start searching for some autoantigen against which they can attack. You understand? So this is hygiene hypothesis. So hygiene hypothesis has been linked to inflammatory bowel diseases because it alters the immune st uh, the immune cells start searching for autoantigens. Okay. So uh, the two important base of the inflammatory bowel diseases then are altered microbiome. So microbiome which is normally protective somehow it is altered. Then aberrant immunity. Immune cells are behaving aberrantly and they are showing excessive response either to the normal antigen which shouldn't happen. So aberrant immunity. And the third is epithelial dysfunction. So there is some kind of epithelial barrier dysfunction which is occurring okay which is a culprit in inflammatory bowel diseases. Okay. So now let's first understand and there must be some genes, you know, which can uh, alter the immunity or cause epithelial dysfunctions which so that some people are more prone to get IBDs and some people are not. So who uh, more commonly, which uh, uh, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, which is more commonly linked with genes? So Crohn's. Okay, S Crohn's is more strongly linked with genes. So therefore, if you look at uh, uh, the twins, okay, so if they, uh, if they ask you, genetic associations are more common in which disease Crohn's or ulcerative colitis it is Crohn's disease so they have defined certain genes which are typically associated with Crohn's disease what are these genes so first gene that you should remember is NOT2 gene do you remember what is NOT2 gene yes NOT2 gene is NOT2 is an innate immune receptor okay so it's present in the cytoplasm of the cell to respond to any 
damp, danger associated signals or any uh, bacterial uh, peptides coming in the cytoplasm and it has the power of activating NF kappa B pathway. So once ha what happens in Crohn's disease is this pathway is abnormally activated, this pathway gets altered and it starts responding to uh, any um, normal bacteria also excessively. Okay, So therefore uh, infla infective pathology has been linked to Crohn's disease. They found that Crohn's usually is associated with s uh, Saccharomyces cervicae infection. So this is usually associated with Saccharomyces cervicae infection and that is why they found that these patients usually have presence of anti Saccharomyces cervicae antibody or anti-flagellant antibodies. So because of this bacteria probably so our immune cells start responding abnormally to this bacteria okay so first gene that you studied today is not two now let's come to the second two genes okay so second two genes are number one ATG okay ATG is autophagy related gene so it is an autophagy controlling gene 16 L1 this is autophagy gene and IRGM is also an autophagy gene both of them are genes which are related to autophagy. So both of them are related to autophagy. Okay. So if you talk about these, they are related to autophagy. So here when these are altered, they uh, are not able to remove the microbes well and also it has been implicated that they also somehow alter the epithelial barriers. Okay. So because they alter the autophagy and they alter the epithelial barriers uh, and so they are also linked with Crohn's. So remember what are the three genes associated with Crohn's? NOT2, ATG16L1 and IRGM. Okay. So these are the three genes associated with Crohn's disease. Whereas when I look at the ulcerative colitis, so there are less gene predisposition seen in ulcerative colitis but they still they have defined some. Okay. So first is, first gene that they have defined is ECM1. Okay. So what is ECM1? extracellular matrix 1 extracellular matrix 1 gene so this is a molecule which inhibits matrix metalloproteinases okay so you know matrix metalloproteinases uh, normally when uh, we talk about matrix uh, metalloproteinases are there so matrix metalloproteinases somehow decrease the severity of colitis so ECM okay so ECM is a molecule which inhibits the matrix metalloproteinases so if its polymorphism is seen it is associated with ulcerative colitis so polymorphisms of ECM1 are associated with ulcerative colitis the second gene that has been linked is HNF alpha polymorphisms do you remember HNF alpha you have studied yes it is associated with MODI okay maturity onset diabetes okay so its polymorphism also decreases the intestinal barrier function so when the intestinal barrier function is disrupted you already know epithelial dysfunction is a major culprit of uh, IBDs so it is associated with ulcerative colitis so ECM1 and HNFA polymorphisms are associated with ulcerative colitis okay now so remember uh, everybody should be clear about it so ECM1 polymorphisms and HNF alpha polymorphisms okay are associated with ulcerative colitis now let's exactly go into the pathogenesis how does it happens how does it happens okay so look at this so first as soon as we, uh, we look at the causative organism we have saccharomyces service infection and this is associated with anti-flagellant antibodies or ASCA okay anti saccharomyces service antibody or anti flagellant antibody see any bacteria in our body is picked up by dendritic cell who picks it up dendritic cells so these dendritic cells will immediately go and do one thing first they will go and activate th1 cells so if th1 cells are the predominant cells that are activated this is Crohn's disease. So in Crohn's disease predominantly it will go in and activate Th1 cells. So these Th1 cells will release interferon gamma which will change macrophages into epithelioid cells and this uh, will form a granuloma. Also macrophages will reduce, uh, re uh, release TNF which will cause more epithelial damage. That's seen in Crohn's. Now what happens in ulcerative colitis? Okay. So now ulcerative colitis predominantly 
TH2 cells are activated. Which cells are activated? TH2 cells are activated. It will go and release interferon uh, interleukin 4 and an interleukin 13. So interleukin 4 again will uh, stimulate more antibody production. Just now you saw ASCA antibodies, anti-flagellin antibodies. So this antibody production is increased by TH2. Okay, and third, it will produce interleukin 13, which will cause more epithelial damage. More epithelial damage. Also, dendritic cells produce interleukin 23. Okay, this interleukin 23 activates TH17. TH17 will release interleukin 17 and interleukin 22, which will stimulate neutrophils. I hope you remember in all the active diseases, you will see cryptapsis, that is neutrophils filling inside the crypts. So that means this can occur in any ulcerative, any uh, IVD, ulcerative colitis also, Crohn's also, okay. So dendritic cells secrete interleukin 23, which will uh, release, uh, which will activate TH17, producing interleukin 17 and 22 and increasing neutrophilia. More the activity of disease is done by, activity of the disease is increased by interleukin 23, okay. So now, everybody should be clear here, suppose interleukin 23 is mutated there is a polymorphism of interleukin 23 then what will happen severity of ibd what will happen it will be decreased you understand why because if interleukin 23 is mutated it will not activate th 17 no th 17 means no interleukin 17 no interleukin 22 means no neutrophils no cryptapsis no damage to the crypts no alterations of the crypt architecture no further it it will decrease the severity of inflammatory bowel diseases okay so polymorphisms of interleukin 23 will decrease the severity of the disease okay that's first second all of you know that we have immune suppressor immunity suppressor molecules so which are immunity suppressor molecule it is interleukin 10 and tgf beta it is interleukin 10 and tgf beta so remember always interleukin 10 and tgf beta are there so these are immunity suppressors. So what does interleukin 10 says? No, 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 suppress the immunity, suppress the immunity. So what happens? It decreases the severity of the disease. But suppose if interleukin 10 gets mutated, so interleukin 10 and uh, or interleukin 10 receptor gets mutated, then what will happen? Then there will be nobody to suppress the immunity. Then T cells will get more virulent. It is like, you know, there are angry people everywhere, who angry people who will keep on fighting. So there will be pacifiers who will say, no, 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 don't fight, don't fight, it's okay, it's okay, relax, relax. That is interleukin 10. It's a pacifier. But if something happens to the pacifier, if pacifier is killed, what will happen? The angry people will start fighting and attacking everybody, isn't it? So same thing happens here. So if interleukin 10 gets mutated or its receptor gets mutated, it will cause a very severe early onset IBD. It will cause a very severe early onset inflammatory bowel disease. 